Well, guys, we are in the book of Psalms. You got a Bible, I hope, that I hope you brought with you in one way or another tonight. If you did, bring it, open it to Psalm 15, which is where we're going to be this evening. We're going to go through Psalm 15 and 16. We have Bibles around you if you need one, uh, page number even on the screen, so you can join us as we're continuing our track through the Psalms, longing that God would meet us in his word in a way that takes these songs and prayers that are found in the book of Psalms that meet us in a way that both are truth expressed, but truth felt. I mean, it's really one of the things that makes Psalms Psalms, is it kind of grabs us at the heart and can, can kind of just communicate to us in layers and places that go beyond where just reasoning can get. I just really long that God would do that in your life this evening. So let's take one more moment in prayer and simply ask for that. Simply ask, would you just ask God to speak to you through this evening? I believe he really wants to. But that you would ask for that, that you would position your heart to be in a place to hear his voice would be altogether the right thing right now. So let's do that. God, right now we just come and we need to hear you. God, we thank you for your word that is powerful and so effective. Lord, I thank you for the book of Psalms that communicate truth to us and yet does so in a way that dives in deep and meets us in our hearts and, and, and communicates to us in depths and layers that sometimes even just reasoning can't get to. I pray that you do that this evening and that even as we just read through these, that your word would just penetrate and heal and rescue and speak. God, give us ears to hear from you, just to hear your voice in the midst of your word in the midst of this time this evening. We ask for that together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Psalms 15 and 16. Oh, that's what we're going to do our best to cover this evening. They are both songs that David wrote. Now, David did not write all the Psalms. Less than half of them are, are written by David. But David, known as the sweet psalmist of Israel, this man that God just communicates to us so often through in the Psalms, he does such an amazing job. And one of the interesting things about the Psalms is realizing all the different avenues whereby that comes. Sometimes it's through a struggle. Sometimes it's through a question. Sometimes it's rejoicing. Sometimes it's sorrow. I mean, there's so many aspects where David finds himself worshiping. But sometimes it's not necessarily related to a specific situation. Not as far as we can tell. In fact, it's a little bit more of just a celebration of God's truth. And it's an interesting thing. That's one of the ways God meets us. I think about how he words it to us in the book of Colossians, where God tells us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I mean, just to, to let God's word just soak into your life, that God's word would just be a part of that. And he says it needs to be there in wisdom, that you are just growing in your understanding of it. it should happen through teaching, by God's grace. I hope that's happening this evening. It should happen through admonishing one another. That's like date. That's just friends encouraging each other in the Bible. Hey, these are ways where God's word can just be rich in your life. But then it goes on to say not only in that, but also in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing. <laughs> that you ought to be singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That one of the ways that God takes his truth and causes it just to be abundant in our lives. One of the ways that he can do that is through a song. That sometimes it is through a song that God can communicate something that somehow he just couldn't get you with with something else. And sometimes it is through just considering his ways. And sometimes those songs that just consider his truth, it meets us in a way that's an incredible thing. That's exactly what David's doing in both of these songs. He's considering God. He's considering who God is and, and, and what God is. And he's just singing about uh, the, the relationship that he has with God and how that works. And as David brings that to us this evening, my simple longing is that the word of Christ would dwell in you richly, that you would find yourself, your spiritual tank, if you will, just filled up by God. And maybe, again, it would be through something I say, but maybe just be in the words that are there, kind of the, the song that David sings. Well, that's where we want to go this evening. And in this first song, David wants to talk to us about 
just how he has an abiding or how to have, if you will, an abiding relationship with the Lord. Notice with me Psalm 15. It just begins with just a simple uh, introduction. Psalm 15, a psalm of David. That's pretty unique in the rest of the psalms that David puts. He says, no instructions, nothing else there. Just a song that David's singing. And he asks the question. Lord, verse 1, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? David's question is about that. I just want, you know, how do we do that? How do we abide with God? How do we dwell with him? Now, when David says this, he's using descriptive words. He's not talking literally. He's not talking like, how can I have an apartment inside the tabernacle or temple? I mean, how do I, you know, how do I, he's not using that. And David never kind of approaches it that way. It really is a, a, a phrasing that's used all the way through the Bible. It's just, how do we abide? How do we stay just in God's presence? How do we dwell there? And he's talking about how to have and, and maintain that close relationship with God. Now, let me be very, very clear. He is not talking about the nature of how to become saved this evening. He's not talking to us about the, the place of knowing that we're sinners and, and, and the need of a Savior and finding Christ. I mean, those are incredible things, and they are so much a part of that. They are the things that bring us into a relationship with God. But David is not talking about that opening that introduces us or inaugurates us or begins us in a relationship with God. He's talking about how to have that, how to just live in that. Now, for David, this was passion. I mean, for David, it was the thing, one of the things that drove him. One of the thought, so, songs I love in Psalm 27 is David says it this way. He says, one thing. <laughs> There's just one thing I really want from God. If God will only answer one prayer for me. He says, this is what I'm seeking. I just want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I just want to be with God. I just want to enjoy his presence. I mean, it was David's passion. I put before you, it was one of the things that made David, David. He wasn't the only one. All the way through the scriptures, we find that, this, this desire to have that. But let's just be very, very clear. None of us in this room have that. Not to the extent that we, we could, should, or will. In fact, we could just say it this way. None of us have a 24-7 relationship with God where we're just in his presence all the time. Now, again, I just want to make sure I say that in the most gracious way. But also so you know you're not the only one. In fact, I'll go so far as to say I don't think anybody in this room has spent 24 hours straight, like never moving from God. No, again, we're not talking about how you get in a relationship, but just distance. You know how that works, right? Where you've heard the old euphemism, just, hey, if, you know, if you're distant from God, guess who moved? You know, it wasn't God. I mean, if you find yourself like enjoying God's presence one moment, and then the next moment, it's like it, all of a sudden there's distance there. All of a sudden, there's distance there, and you're kind of trying to figure out what that is. I mean, we could say it in the most simple way. That's what sin does. I mean, sin in its very just essential nature separates. The very just fundamental thing that sin does is it cuts us off in a relationship with God. It cuts us off in a relationship with other people. And David's just struggling with this. Again, he's, just, he's struggling with this, and he, and he finds himself just asking this question, like, how do I do that? How do I stay in God's presence? I mean, because it's amazing to be in God's presence. It's amazing to enjoy that. And I hope you understand what that is. But it's frustrating at times to find yourself all of a sudden just distant. And you're like, how did that, how did that happen? <laughs> I mean, how did I, how, you know, it was so good five minutes ago. It was so good an hour ago. It was so great yesterday. What happened today? How come I didn't stay? That's, that's what David's asking. And he's going to go through some answers that are interesting, but let me just tell you right now, it's a little bit of a hard section to absolutely lock down. David's going to give a list of things that he finds that, that separate him from a relationship with God. Now, they are not all inclusive. I mean, it's not like this is like the whole list of things that separate us from God, nor is it necessarily even a perfect outline of all of those things. Now, these are things that probably for David, they were just so real to him. These were the things that, you know, when he kind of analyzed his life, they're like, this is what, I mean, I'm in God's presence for one moment, and then I, something happens that just moves me out of it, and David writes him down. Now, though, again, they're not all inclusive. I think they're helpful. They were for David, and they've been for me. 
And several of these verses are just locked into my heart that very often come back to me. And, and, and so I'm hoping that God would just meet you as you're it, hopefully just trying to get there. Again, I, I wish I could make sure that you were. I wish you could understand how important this is, where it's like, I just would love, love to just, just stay in God's presence. I mean, just to enjoy him and then just keep enjoying and not have myself drift, not have something happen that separates not have that relationship hindered or muted at all. As David's exploring this, he says so with a couple of things. He answers the question this way. I'll just begin reading again in verse 1. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Verse 2, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart begins with a list of things that are really needed, necessary things to do in that sense that, that really augment it and, and keep that relationship going. It says you just got to walk. It's just a day by day walking with God, doing the right, I mean, being upright. That, that's kind of how it works. Again, to say it in the most simple way, if you're distant from God, guess who moved? You walked away. I mean, it's like, you just got to walk right. I just got to stay, I just got to keep in this relationship that's an upright relationship, got to be working those things which are right, do the things that are pleasing in God's eyes, that's righteousness. And, and he even adds to it this idea that he speaks the truth in his heart. It's a great little description that, just give it to you briefly, it has the idea of speaking with authenticity. We've been talking about authenticity a lot in James, so I use that word here. The opposite of this is hypocrisy pretending to be something on the outside that you're not on the inside. He says, no, I want to speak the truth in my heart. I want, I want it to be where what's happening, I, I mean, I'm just being real. I'm real with God, and, I, and I'm not faking it. There's just a, a speaking of truth that is happening. You know, I'm not just pretending things are okay, but it's happening on the inside of who I am. And David's able to look on these things. They, they, you know, those, when, I, when I'm walking with God, when I'm enjoying God's presence, this is what's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm walking uprightly, I'm doing the right things, and I'm not faking it, I'm, I'm being authentic, and, and David's able to look and say, those things are needed to maintain this relationship with God. But then he gives us a list of things that we shouldn't do, things that all of a sudden just snap that relationship. He says he does not backbite, verse 3, with his tongue, nor does evil with, to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against a friend. He says he doesn't slander, doesn't backbite. Word that has the idea of accusing and condemning, which is actually one of the things that Satan is known for biblically. He says he's not going to do that, not going to do something where you even do evil to a neighbor or take up a reproach against a friend. And there's kind of a flow here, but I think maybe you might catch this. This list isn't so much talking about this doing what's right or, or being right with God. That was the first list. The first list is like, you got to do the right thing. <laughs> like, don't sin. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to want to walk with God, don't sin. Do what's right. Walk uprightly. That's, that's it. But he says, this list is all about people. It's like, I don't want to slander somebody. I don't want to be someone where all of a sudden I'm becoming someone who is speaking badly to or backbiting, uh, you know, with his tongue. I don't want to do, do evil to somebody else. I don't want to reproach, and reproach is an interesting word that can, you know, in one sense, be doing something, but some sense to take up a reproach is even to receive that, to, to kind of listen to gossip, to allow that whole thing to work in, and here David just lets us know that here's the problem. I mean, all those are bad things. I mean, they're bad things to do. They're, they're wrong to do to people, but they're fundamentally something that actually messes up our relationship with God. David's like, you know, how do I stay in God's presence? And he says, you know what, there, I, I know what it's like to just lose it in a moment. You know what happened? I began being cruel to somebody else. I, 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 I slandered somebody. I, I did something wrong to somebody else. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, against God or, or disobeying God. I did something there. And the funny thing, not funny, but the thing that is so real about that is that when we get wrong with people, God won't let us be right with him. I think about the way that John says it to us. He says, if someone says, you know, I love God and hates his brother, John says, you're lying. 
can't happen. I mean, just, sometimes I love when they just make it. It's like, that's a lie. It's impossible for you to be right with God and wrong with people. It just can't happen. You can't do that. God won't let you do that. And so David's thinking this through. It's like, I know what that's like. I mean, there I am enjoying God's presence, and, and I didn't you know, do anything against God, but I allowed myself to you know, begin criticizing, gossiping, slandering somebody else. And somehow in the moment, it is all, all of a sudden you realize, just God's not walking with me. I don't feel his presence. It's like, what happened? David's like, I know what happened. I know what happened. I found myself in this place of, of criticizing, critiquing, condemning, doing evil, reproaching, slandering. And he's like, that, that robs me of God's presence. And David's like, that's, it. that's not what I want to do. And that's not where I want to go. That's not the things that I have. And then he gives us another list. So and again, these are the way I'm outlining it, but there is a definite you know, flow to it. There are things that you need to do. Do the right thing. Walk uprightly. Be real with God. There are things you can't do, and that's, you know, be cruel and wrong to other people. But he takes us even further that sometimes it can even be in the, the passions or the desires or the focuses of our heart. Notice with me what he says in verse 4. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a, a bribe against the innocent. I would put this whole list together. Again, you might outline it differently, but it begins in an interesting way. He says, here's the thing. You know, you've got to despise. He says, if, if, if you're in a place where you, you look upon that which is evil and, 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 and wicked, and you think, that's, just, that's, I, that's ugly. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Contrast to that, you love what's right. He says, you know, at the same moment, it's like, you know, you honor those who fear the Lord. And, and, and so right now, it's not a, a matter of what we're doing or not doing. It's a matter of what we're placing honor on and dishonor on. And I want to tell you, this is so powerful. You know, one of my verses that just work this greatly in my own life is in Hebrews 1, where it speaks of Jesus. And it tells us of Jesus that you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. It says, you know, of Jesus, he loved. I mean, he loved what was right. And he hated, he hated what was wrong, and that was joy. And it's joy, joy that is really God, God's presence, God's work all over that. I don't know if that's how you see Jesus. You know, I have a sense that probably for some of us, we have a, an inaccurate view of Jesus. Maybe it's from, from some movie that we saw or some just preconception of some, you know, boring, you know, even just stern, uh, you know, not having a good day kind of thing. But that's not the way Hebrews describes them. It's like, you know what, there is nobody, there is nobody that had more joy than Jesus. You want to know why he had joy? Because he loved. He loved what was right. And he hated what was wrong. You know, there's something about that, that just when, you're, when your heart is there and and David's able to look in this, and, and I put before you for David, as he's making this list, they're probably just very real things in his own life. He's like, I know what that was like. Maybe you do as well. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you had a, a good time, a quiet time with the Lord. You read the Bible. It was a good morning. Things were off to a good starter. Maybe you came to church, and it was like God met you, and you're like, this is really, really good. And then something happens. You find yourself watching something, maybe watching a television program or just a video on Facebook or something or something. And, and all of a sudden, your, your desires, they just shift. And, and instead of honoring, loving what God loves and hating what God hates, you just, just your, your, your very focus became off and you, and you became kind of envious of, of the things of the wicked or, or just kind of doing that. And all of a sudden, it's like just you and God are on different pages. That's what David's saying. He's like, man, I hate that. It's like I was enjoying God's presence. I was enjoying that. How do I stay in God's presence? Well, I need to be this. I got to make sure that I'm looking through the lens that God looks through. That to stay in his presence means that, God, I want to see the world with the lens that you see it. And that really is not always just what you do and don't do. Sometimes it's just what you have great honor for and what you despise. What you hate and what you love, well, sometimes that determines where your, where your heart is, where your life is, and sometimes even your relationship with God. 
He gives us that. He calls us to that. And then he adds this. Verse 4, at the end of it, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. We call that integrity. Um, It's a needed thing in our world, lacking often. This is one of the verses that just ring in my head sometimes. I don't know about anybody else. This whole list, several in this list kind of are, are effective in my life. When I find myself distant from God, they come up or wondering, okay, what, what's happening right now? And this is one of them. David talks about a righteousness, the kind of thing that you become a person of your word. Jesus would say, you know, let your yes be yes and your no be no. That you should be known for a person that when you say it, People can count on you. And there's a great danger in that place where sometimes you can make a commitment, say you're going to do something, and then all of a sudden it becomes not advantageous for you to do so. Maybe you make a business dealing, if you will, and all of a sudden you find out it's going to rob you of money. You're not going to make money. You're going to lose money. And it's really common just to kind of, you know, well, you know, I know I said, but there's, there's, a, there's a level of righteousness that says, I said I'd do it. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a person of my word. And, and God actually takes that very seriously. So much so that when that doesn't happen, sometimes God will just step back from you. It's not that you would lose your relationship with him, but you lose his presence. Where God's like, that, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, you are not walking in integrity. And, and, and that lack of being a person of integrity can actually hinder your walk with God. And David's like, no, you know what I want to do? I'm going to be a person that I say something, and when I find out it's still going to hurt, I still do it. I think it's powerful. So much I could say there, but I just want to tell you that God is calling us to be a people of our word. And then he gives us this list in, in verse 5 where he says, he does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. I was thinking about that a little bit, and, and just in this list of things that he's talking about, he says, you know, you're not going to, you know, tr- take, you know, you, you know, rip people off. That's the idea of usury. It had a very specific connotation within the Jewish culture. But you could carry that into our culture and our lives where basically you become, you know, one that takes advantage of people, that, that you know, takes money and, 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 and rips people off. Or on the other hand, could be bribed, that money would become a motivating factor. And, and I found myself thinking about it, and I'll just say it this way, that there's a place where God calls us not to be just motivated and moved by money, that that's not the thing that decides what we're going to do. And I was thinking about that specifically in the relation to what it tells us in Timothy. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's a very misquoted Bible verse, by the way. Sometimes people say that money is the root of all evil. It's not. It's the love of it. You, you can have a lot of money and not love it. You can have no money and love it. It's about loving it. And he says, when you love money, when money becomes the motivating factor of your life, it becomes a, a seedbed of sin. But it also causes you to strive. Causes you to move away from God and from the faith. It it creates distance between you and God. And and God's just saying, that's not where I want that to be. I don't want you to be in this place that that, that's a motivating factor in your life because these things separate you from God. I think about it. David's writing this list of things, and maybe they're a similar list in your life. Maybe you're like, okay, this is my list too. Or maybe you have other things as well, but David's actually thinking it through. He's actually thinking, okay, what, what, what robs me of God's presence? What keeps me in God's presence? As he gives this list, he ends it by simply saying, he who does these things shall never be moved. I mean, if you just, you'll be in God's presence, and you won't move from his presence. You won't find yourself, you know, in God's presence one moment and distance the next. He says, if you could just do these things. And David's thinking about what robs him. And I'm just telling you, maybe again, this list is yours, or maybe you need a list. Maybe you've never thought about it. Maybe you live it. If you're a Christian, I, I know that you do know something of God's presence. But because of our struggles, again, you, you know what it's like to, to be in God's presence and then be out of God's presence, to enjoy his smile and then feel his distance. 
And in one sense, what, what David's challenging you to do is like, ask, like, what in the world happened? How does that happen to me? How is it that I could enjoy God one moment? What moves me out of his presence? And for David, he had a list. He's like, these are the things that, that I need. And, and, and in one sense, they, they do apply to our life. I mean, certainly to do what's right, to, to, to not sin, to be walking with God, to not be you know, d- dealing with people badly, to, to love what's right, hate what's wrong. And yet, again, for David, these were probably, most Bible students who look at this, think that you know, he could probably you know, give you time and date for each one of them. I mean, he's like, I learned on this day. I learned on this day that when I do this, God pulls back from me. I learned on this day, this is where I learned that God is not okay with me doing that because he, he distances himself from me. But I've also learned that if I just do this, I can enjoy his presence. I can, I can stay in his presence. And it's a good thinking through because that's so much what we want, just a place of being able to abide with God, to enjoy his presence. And it's exactly what David was after. Well, we think that through for a moment and then we want to leave that for a second, though we're not entirely done with that concept. David continues in Psalm 16 and and now he gives an incredible psalm that really is about trusting God's care. Notice with me how it begins. Psalm 16 says it this way. It begins by saying, a mickum of David. Hey, let's give a quick pause and talk about that because it's the first time we've come across it. A mickum. What's a mickum? Well, you know what? We don't know. <laughs> Not exactly. That's why they put it there because they're like, it, it's kind of like, what does that actually mean? Bible students wrestle through it back and forth, unsure. We know that there are six Psalms that are titled this way. Psalm 16 is one. And then Psalms 56 to 60 are all called mickums. What makes them that? Well, again, it's, it, you know, Bible students wrestle with it. Some think it, it comes out of a Hebrew word that have the idea of being etched or something that is absolutely solid. Some think it might come from a word that has the idea of something that would be golden or precious. Both of those who kind of look at this in one sense say, hey, these are like, lock this down. <laughs> this is like, you know, golden material top 10 song kind of thing. You know, this is one of the ones you want to make sure you get is perhaps what David was thinking. We don't know for certain, but definitely is a possibility. Well, I leave that with you, but let's see what he's going to say. Verse one, he gives it to us this way. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. David's, the song really is this. It's about a place of trusting God. And he's asking for God to preserve. Now, preserve, he's not just saying rescue. It's not the word for, you know, deliver me. It's not that kind of word, preserve. In fact, it would have the idea of watching over. It would kind of be that Psalm 23 mentality. The Lord is my shepherd. He takes care of me kind of thing. And David's thinking about that. He's asking God, would you care about me? Would you, would you just take care of me? Because I trust you. I trust you is, is what he's saying. And, and as, he, as he thinks about these things, he just works that through in his own life and he recognizes that place of his trust is really in the righteousness that comes from God. It's a great psalm. In fact, it's really good after what we just read to read verse two. He says, oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. David recognized that his relationship with God was not based on David. (laughs) And it's just so true. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. I mean, we think about it. We talked about good works on Sunday and and James. We're going to talk about it again this Sunday. But we now understand this, that actually, biblically, if if we ever do anything good, it's God who did it. I love the way Isaiah said it. You know, all of my good works, God did in me. I mean, it's actually God. I mean, if I ever do anything right... Is God, and the only way I can have this relationship, the only way I can enjoy God's favor is by his mercy and his grace. And David's saying that. He says, you know, I just recognize that, that, that where my place is, where I can be preserved by God, is all by God. And yet as he thinks about this, he just gives a list here. And I've got to be honest, I'm going to give a kind of an outline as we work through the rest of this psalm, but I struggled a lot with kind of doing an outline. It's a terrible outline, if I can be honest. 
because it's, it's hard to outline, but I love it. In fact, I wish we had like an hour or two just to work through Psalm 16. We don't, but I love Psalm 16, and it just says it better than I can. So though I'm going to put a little outline, you don't have to even pay attention to it. It might not help you. It might help you to kind of lock some thoughts down, but if it doesn't, just hear the words. Because David's talking about this relationship that he has with God where he trusts God and God is his shepherd that preserves him. And as he thinks it through, he says it this way in verse 3. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. He says, I just love God's people. I love them. I, I, I delight in those who are pursuing God. He's thinking about this relationship where he has with God, where he just enjoys God's favor and and finds God's protection and blessing. He's like, I just, I love being with your people. I love that. And, and, and you should. You should. That's definitely a part of how that whole thing works. Where part of where God would bring our lives is to even meet us to his people. And I hope he's doing that to you tonight. As he thinks about just walking with that, he then kind of just thinks about what he has in God and God's people have in God. And then he looks on those who are pursuing a false God. Because every other God's a false God. He said, their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. It's just a great description. He says, what a, what a terrible, you know, when I realize how good God is, I realize how miserable people must be that go after another God. Because they don't have God. They don't have what I have. They don't, they don't have that. You know, I, I have something amazing in God. And when somebody who pursues another God who's not a God, he's like, man, how sad. Their sorrows are multiplied who pursue another God. As David thinks about people pursuing other gods, he says, their drink offerings of blood I will not offer. He says, I want nothing to do with other false gods. I, I, I'm not going to do half in, half out with, with our God. He says, I'm not going to take up the names, their, their names on my lips. He says, I don't want to have any part of that. You know, I recognize that every other God out there is a phony God. He says, it's such a sad thing to watch people pursuing things that aren't going to help them. And David said, I don't have any part of that. It's not going to be where I am because that's not where my help is. He then adds to it in verse 5. Oh, Lord, you are my portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Boy, there's a bunch there. He looks on this and he says, you know, God, you are my portion. The idea of, of, of portions, you know, you definitely, if you understand the Old Testament and the children of Israel coming into the land, and they get the land of, uh, of promise, and then they divide it all up, and they, and they put boundaries, and they'd say, okay, this is your boundary, this is your property, this is the, the extent of your inheritance. David's using those concepts. He says, okay, God, my portion, it's God. You know, what, my portion in this life, it's God himself. God, you're my portion. You're the blessing that I have. You're my inheritance. You're my cup. You maintain my lot. The, 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 my portion in life, it's you, what you give me. And he says, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. When I realize that my life has been marked out and, and these are the boundaries of what my life can be, I have a really good life. Now, here's the thing. Yeah, you may already kind of catch this, but David is actually talking about what he has in this world. His possessions, his influence, his position, all those would be included in this. But for David, he ties that all into his relationship with God, so much so that God really defines that. Now, I just want you to understand that is big, and it's meant to be for all of us. Paul would say it this way, or the writer of Hebrews would say it this way. It says, let the, your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, when you think about what you have in this world, you should be happy. In fact, you should be content. Why? Because God's with you. God is with you. That should really define it. I'm just telling you right now, we live in a very discontented society where it's almost perpetually discontent, where that's encouraged by marketing, it's encouraged by so many things, so much so that we don't even realize we're doing it. But it's an amazing place if you could come right now and say, you know what? I have a good life. 
my God, he's, if I don't have, if there's something I need that I don't have, he could give it to me. And God, if you want to, I mean, you should ask him. God, give me everything you want for me. Open up every job, you know, expand my position or shrink it. Grow my, you know, what I have in the bank or shrink it. Whatever you want, but God, I want to define success. Not by where I fall on the scale with me and my neighbors. My success is God. God, you're with me. You're my inheritance. You're the one that provides all of this, and I can content because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that it's God's presence that actually even defines just that joy. And David's able to look at his life and say, when I think about trusting God in my life, when I think about God as my good shepherd, as I think about his watchful care over my life, I find myself being able to say, God is good because you're good. You're the hope. You're the strength of my life. And it's so incredibly powerful. I love those verses. And honestly, they are a part of my prayers, not in an uncommon way, where I will just say that to God. God, you know what? The lines are are, have fallen to me in pleasant places. You're my inheritance. You are everything that I want. And, and God, whatever you want to give me with that is fine, but I want you. And, and just to find that that defines everything is amazing. As David thinks about these things and, and just God's blessing and who he is, he says, I will bless the Lord, verse 7, who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And at this moment, David, as he's thinking about God's care over his life, he's, he's looking kind of at the way God has met him daily. He says, God, you counsel me. You give me truth. I mean, you speak to me your word. He's like, you know, you, you, you've, you've given me counsel. And you know, some of those dark seasons, when it feels in the middle of the night, you've met me in those two. You know, you, you, my heart instructs me in the night seasons. And then he just recognizes again that no matter what he's gone through, God has never left him. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. God never leaves me or forsakes me. I think I have it pretty good. I mean, just it's an amazing thing. I don't know if you ever think these things through. I don't know why it is, but sometimes when I'm visiting people in the hospital, I'll, I'll think these things through. I'll sit there and think, you know, I mean, if we have access to God, we have something that so many people in this place do not have. I have a God that cares, who never leaves me or forsakes me. I have a God who, who is at work in our lives, and we could trust Him. And, and what an amazing place it is to be able to navigate through, through some difficult situations and say, you know what? I have God. But it makes life, wow. I mean, I am so blessed to have God that walks through all of these things in my life, and He is that. And then David comes to this section that is probably one of my favorites in this psalm, though I got to be honest, I love so much of this psalm. He says in verse 9 through 11, he says, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Wow. Well, we think this through, and in many ways, there's much there, but it might be helpful. I'm going to go ahead and leave our outline and just push this up to the top as we're thinking about hope in God. And he begins it by just saying that he is so glad. He says, you know, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope. And the, and the word rest actually has the idea of secure or strong or strengthened, or I'm going to use the word anchored. I like that, and I think about the word in Hebrews where it talks about this, that we have Jesus as an anchor for our soul. Same thought given there that is here. He says, when I think about my life, I'm anchored. I have an anchor. I have something that I rest in. It's in my heart, David says. It's my glory. It's my flesh. He says, my heart is glad. My, my glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope. He says, I have all of these things that I can find myself just glad. I can find myself rejoicing. I can find myself confident. Well, what is that? Where is my hope? Well, you probably already get it, but he tells us really that the hope is in the resurrection. Now, it's an amazing little section that has, again, incredible depth for you guys that want to dive in deeper because the hope of the, uh, of the resurrection is the hope of Christ. It's the only reason that the resurrection means anything to us. 
In fact, that's what David's even saying here. Maybe he realizes it in full. Maybe he didn't, but God did. See, in Acts 2, Peter's preaching, and he quotes this, and he's explaining to the multitude that are there that are asking, you know, what's happening here? Why are we in the midst of all this? And he's telling them about Jesus, about Jesus who they crucified and who God rose up. And, and he says this to him. He says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. So I just want to tell you right now, David, who wrote Psalm 16, <laughs> he died. And you know what? He's still in the tomb. He's buried. He's still here. That's, that's where he is. It says David's there. He, 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 he was died and he buried. But he says, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, that he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. Again, big mouthful. But he says, you know, God, that David was speaking not just practically here, but prophetically. That here in Psalm 16, he's saying something that, uh, that's prophetic, that's, that's going to be incredibly powerful. He says, he foreseeing this, that God would work in Christ, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. He's quoting Psalm 16 there, where he's telling us there in verse 10, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, you know, that you wouldn't leave it in Hades, that's the New Testament word for that, nor allow his holy one to see corruption. He says, this was about Jesus. David said this about Jesus, that Jesus would not be defeated by the grave, that Jesus would die for our sin. But three days later, he would conquer the grave. He would defeat sin. And he says, you know, that's what he's speaking about. And David is just rejoicing in that. Now, here's the thing. You might be thinking, well, is this, is this then all about Jesus? Well, no, it, it, it's because Jesus rose that the resurrection means anything to us. We think about how God, God would give it to us in, in 1 Corinthians 15, but now Christ is risen from the dead. He conquered the grave, and he became the first fruits. He became the beginning of those who have fallen asleep, which is a term for us in Christ, that he became the one that, that rose from the grave, and he's the beginning of that so that now all of us who are in Christ, we're going to defeat the grave. The grave's not going to win. You know, it, we're not going to stay, you know, just Sheol won't be there. We're not going to live in that. God is going to come back. We're going to be resurrected. We're going to get these brand new bodies when Jesus comes back. And all of that, again, is because of Christ, which is an incredibly rich, but it's important that I just tell you here, that's why we have hope. It's because of Christ. Well, again, he's saying that. He says, I, I rest in this hope. Because you're not going to leave Jesus in, in the tomb, and therefore because he's not going to be left in the tomb, in a sense, we're not. But then he says to me what is so amazing. He says, you're going to show me the path of life. And your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He says, you're going to show me. He's showing us even now. What's this path? What is this path we're on? Where is it going? I mean, what is life about? What's the goal? What's the, what's the reason to exist? Where is this road going? If there's a road that we're supposed to be on, what's it about? It's all about his presence. That's what he says. He says, you're going to show me the path of life. You're going to show me the point of living and the point of heaven. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Can I just tell you that it's so that it's going to be fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore? And again, for somebody, you just need to hear this because you just need to know that's what heaven's going to be like. Heaven is going to be better than you have ever imagined. It is going to be fullness of joy. It is going to be pleasure, not for five minutes. You know, you're not going to get bored like, okay, well, we've been in heaven for 100 years. You know, it's like, it's going to be so, it's going to be fun like every day forever. There are going to be pleasures forevermore. And I just want you to know that. But do not miss it. Though it's incredibly good to catch this. Though it's incredibly good to just have this expectation of where we're going. Like, what is life going to? Why are we here? What's this about? It's about God's presence. 
See, the end of this all is that. Heaven's going to be amazing. You know, getting new bodies, I'm all in. I'm not know about anybody else, but it's like, I'm, can I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the new model. You know, this one's got problems, you know, and, and that's just true for all of us. And it's only getting worse. But you know what? That's not going to be the best part of heaven. You know, there's not going to be any sin. There's not going to be anything that ever grieves us again, but that's not going to be the best part. Fellowship is going to be good. We're going to enjoy people. We're going to enjoy life, but that's not going to be the best part. The best part of heaven is going to be fellowshipping with God without end, that you're going to enjoy his presence in a way that you have never even imagined. And if you don't know what that's like, God, I just want you to know, in his presence, in his presence, it's fullness of joy. It is so much joy. It is so much joy. And it's pleasurable forever to enjoy God is everything. I mean, David's just saying, that's, that's where we're going. I mean, that's what this is about. That's what the point of life is. That's what heaven's going to be out. And, and David's saying, that's why I have hope. I have hope of in, in this world of God watching over me because that is where we're going. And if I haven't made it clear, let me tell you, David does this amazing thing because he brings us to the end in Psalm 16, but in some ways it so ties back to where we were in Psalm 15, which is, how do I stay in your presence? I mean, how do I abide in God's presence? You know what? There, there's things we can learn about it now. But it's coming. It is coming. And I don't know, maybe that doesn't excite you like it should. It will. Maybe, maybe we are so selfish, and we are, that sometimes when we think about heaven, really getting the new bodies and not having pain or sorrow or suffering, that just sounds so good. They were like, you know, I just, I just want this, and that's going to be good. But I'm just telling you, we're gonna, we can have a conversation when we're there, and you will say, like the Queen of Sheba, the half of it wasn't told to me. This is better than I have ever dreamed possible, to enjoy God's presence, to, to just stay in his presence. Yeah, that's where we're going. And for David, that was the passion of his life. It was the desire that he didn't want that robbed from him, but it was his comfort. He says, I have rest. I have a solid conviction. I have an anchor of my soul that it's coming, <laughs> that it's coming, that this is where life is going. This is the path I'm on, and it meets me, and it carries me. And I just want to draw you to that now. Really, we come to the end of our evening. I actually need to end there time-wise, but in some ways, it's so good to do so. Because I just want to tell you, that's the point of this whole thing. I mean, I don't know if that's why you came to church tonight. I don't know if you came thinking, I just really want to be near God. You know, you might have came for some other reason. And, I, and, and, and we're just messed up sometimes. But I'm going to tell you, it's what you needed more than anything else. And if you could be in his presence right now and figure out how not to leave his presence, you would have a really good night. But you know, there's such hope in just recognizing that in all of our fallenness and all the, 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 the place of this world, to be able to say, okay, here's what I got. You know, in, in this world, David's saying, I, I love God's people. I, I'm sad for those that are going after other gods, you know, but, but I, I'm just I'm wanting to walk in his ways. I'm wanting to, to, to just pursue him. I trust him and his provision daily in my life. I'm thankful for all of that. But all of that leads me down this path that says I get the path. And the path is him. And I pray that you would begin to experience some of that now. I love the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, that's who he is. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. I so want that. But then he says, and your will be done as it's going to be done in heaven. That in one sense, we're like, I want to I live a little bit more today like I'm going to live then. I, want, I, want, I, want to, I, want to enjoy, I would like to be a little bit more today like I'm going to be then. And I'm just telling you, then it's going to be about God. You're going to be like, ah, in his presence, fullness of joy, right hands, pleasure forevermore. That is so good. Hey, lock that, memorize that, take hope in that, and then draw to that. 
draw that through the Psalms that God would meet you in a way that would even just draw us into his presence. So that's what I want to pray for right now and just long that God would meet you in a way that would draw you to him. Would you join me in prayer? God, thank you for your word. It speaks to me. It speaks to me in ways that I cannot articulate. Thank you for Psalms, just the book of Psalms. Thank you for these two Psalms. Thank you for what they speak to us, and, and may they meet us, Lord. I do pray that you'd help us to abide in your presence, and you would teach us how to be passionate about that, how to be attentive to what moves us and what keeps us in your presence. But God, I thank you right now that you are the shepherd of my soul. I thank you that you watch over me. I thank you for what that means daily. I thank you for what that means in your provision for me now. I thank you for, for how that works out with your people and all the good things that are just mentioned in Psalm 16. But God, I just bring before you the end of it that just speaks in such loud voices to me. God, it's in your presence. In your presence is fullness of joy. Satan's lying, that he would say that sin would be fun or, or good. He's, he's lying. The greatest joys are in your presence. The greatest joys and greatest pleasures are in your presence. At your right hand are pleasures that last forever. God, I pray that you'd help us to know that this evening, and I pray that you'd help us to walk with you. I pray that we'd know that your presence is everything, better than anything else that we could ever imagine I think of the song that we were singing right before we began teaching where we just said, Holy Spirit, let us become more aware of your presence. Lord, just that we'd, we'd be aware of it. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. stand when I stand before your throne dressed in glory not my own what a joy I'll sing of on that day no more tears or broken dreams forgotten is the minor key everything as it was meant to be Worship forever in your presence, we will sing, we will worship, worship you, an endless hallelujah. see you as you are I will see you as you are love you with unsinning heart see how much you paid to bring me home not till then Lord shall I know not till then how much I owe everything I am before your throne Worship forever in your presence. We will sing, we will worship, worship you, an endless hallelujah. more tears no more tears no more shame no more sin and sorrow ever known again no more fears no more 
more pain we will see you face to face see you face to face stand together for this last one. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His own. Worship your holy name. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. rich in love you're rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before your holy name and on that day and on that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise
Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord of my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. I worship your holy name. Worship your holy name, Lord. I'll worship your holy name. Sing like never before. Oh. I worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Oh Lord, we do gather here tonight and just rejoice in you. We thank you for the word that we've heard. We thank you, Lord, for the promises of your word and just the hope that we find there. And Lord, just your presence. I pray that we would know it more and more each day. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.